Steve Vargas Tragedy, Venezuela, 1999. This tragedy was caused by heavy rainfall from the summer of December 14 to the 16th. Triggered thousands of landslides on steep slopes of the Sierra de Avila, north of Caracas, Venezuela. In addition to landslides, heavy rainfall caused flooding and massive debris flows that damaged coastal communities in the state of Vargas along the Caribbean Sea. Venezuela, due to its geographical position, is subject to the influence of the trade winds and the intertropical convergence zone. Those winds blow over the northern regions of the territory with regularity throughout the year and are usually stable, especially over the oceans. With a character of moderate breezes of about 20 km per hour, they are more regular in continental regions. The southern and central regions of the national Venezuelan territory are affected by the continental masses belonging to the intertropical con convergence zone of the southern hemisphere. These masses produce very intense rains as a result of, of the recharge in the humid zones of the Amazon, which influence is pretty noticeable for about seven months of the year, from May or June to October, and even November or December, as it was in this case. The magnitude of the event. Field observations of the severely affected drainage basins and historical records indicate that previous flooding and massive debris flow events of similar magnitude of, to the Vargas tragedy have occurred throughout this region. The volume of debris flow, deposits, and large boulders of the that the flow transport qualifies the 1999 event amongst the largest historical rainfall induced the reflows documented worldwide. This phenomenon had a magnitude never seen before and produced incalculable damage both from the point of view of the loss of human life and destruction of property. What happened is not exceptional since it is meteorological phenomenon that repeats itself from time to time, but this time it had an intensity and consequences never seen before. The geography of Vargas state changed profoundly and that in other sectors of the Venezuelan Caribbean coast, very important changes took place as well. In summary, the consequences were 70% of the state's population was affected 10% of homes were destroyed. Five hospitals and outpatient clinics were damaged. Black and white water systems collapsed. 85% trunk road destroyed. Stoppage of the port, airport and recreational activity. 3% educational infrastructure was affected. 4,000 million in property damage. Figures of 12,000 to 15,000 victims are handled between dead and missing. On the first day of response to the emergency, the Minister of Defense estimated that this disaster had generated more casualties than the country's war of independence. Contributions were received from many countries around the globe who sent different types of aid, especially food and shelter aid. This tragedy made us understand in a brutal and painful way that a disaster is not only the product of a natural phenomenon, but above all, of human intervention in the landscape of ignorance, of the level and development of the town, and the lack of planning in urban occupation, especially since Venezuela was going through a rough patch in its political system due to corruption. So, Mitigation strategies. The selection and design of appropriate mitigation measures depends upon the rate of recurrence of events with different magnitudes and the economic feasibility and acceptability of preventing damage and casualties. More comprehensive field studies and analysis of the historic and prehistoric flood and the reflow events of this region 
are necessary to proceed with disaster mitigation planning. In particular, it's necessary to determine the magnitude frequency relationship between these events and sufficient detail for proceeding with implementation costly structural mitigation measures. The high magnitude and resulting consequence of damages from the reef flows and flooding triggered by this tragedy indicates that mitigation is necessary to victimize, minimize future loss of life and property damage from events of similar or greater magnitude. In conclusion, some of the tension strategies are the approaches to the reef flow hazard mitigation can be generally separated into those involving construction of some type of physical structures and those involving non-structural measures. The non-structural measures for the reef flow hazard mitigation include removing or converting system development, discouraging development, and regulating development. Non-structural measures can be especially most Cost effective if the areas in question are subject to frequent debris flows, such as it is in the case of the state of Vargas in Venezuela. As an alternative, within high hazard zones, the intensity of development can be kept to a minimum, where community can zone hazard prone areas for open space uses, such as parks, grazing, or certain types of agriculture. And here are my sources. Thank you.